My name is Melissa Flora Vixler. I am the pastor of Raleigh Mennonite Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. And it is a joy today to introduce Dr. Brandy Daniels. Brandy Daniels is the assistant professor of theology and of gender, women's, and sexuality studies at the University of Portland. Brandy has published on Bonhoeffer, Foucault, race, post-structuralism, liberation theology, lots and lots of places where you're in the interest. Today, uh, responding to uh, Brandy will be Devin Singh from Dartmouth College. Brandy, I'll turn it over to you. The question of the Christian in society is one that fills us with hope, but at the same time leaves us strangely unsettled. The Christian in society. Society is not left completely to itself. Marriage and family life, the economy and culture, art and science, the state, political parties, international relations are not problem for your uninhibited. They do not simply run their own courses according to laws that have their own logics and drive without being at least conditioned by another factor that is full of promise. We understand better today than we have in the past that the well-worn way is a false way. The catastrophe that we have experienced and in which we still stand has made it shockingly clear to many, but not to all. Wouldn't we prefer to turn away from life and society in deep skepticism and discouragement, but turn to what? One cannot turn away from life. Life surrounds us on all sides. It evokes questions in us. It places decisions before us. We must stand firmly in life. Today, we long for a promise precisely because our eyes have been opened wide to the problematic character of existence. We want out of the society. We want a different society. But this is only a wish. We are painfully aware that despite all of the changes and all of the revolutions, everything remains as it was before. And so we ask, Watchmen, is the night almost gone? It is here that the thought of the Christian in society becomes a promise. Some, or given this context likely most, of you may recognize what I just read as the beginning of Bart's lecture, The Christian in Society, also commonly known as the Tombach Lecture, which was given at a conference in the town of Tombach in Germany in the year 1919. More on the context of that lecture in a moment. Some of you might find some points of resonance in these opening words. I know that I do. One might think here about gun control legislation, despite the ongoing mass shootings, the ongoing interpersonal violence, we cannot seem to get gun control passed. One might think about the setbacks in queer rights legislation, or one might think about the climate. I know here in uh, Princeton, uh, uh, like a week ago, you couldn't see, right, with all the fires from Canada, right? There's wildfires in Canada, like now, right? And yet we still can't, you know, even limit our carbon emissions. And the fires in Canada, right, from like the monoculture carbon offset that, right, like the levels of irony there. So uh, our eyes have been opened wide to the problematic nature of existence. Some of you might, however, find some points of dissonance here as well, or at least I do. The question of the Christian in society certainly leaves me strangely unsettled, but I'm not sure it fills me with hope. Sure, on the one hand, I have been deeply moved by some ways I've seen some Christians bear witness to Christ in their lives and in the world uh, and to seek to live out the truth of that. I've also seen a, non, a lot of non-Christians act that way, for that matter. Uh, moreover, and more significantly perhaps, there are a whole lot of Christians who, well, do quite the opposite, um, thinking particularly of the white nationalists who act in the name of God, I'm thinking of the recent death of Pat Robertson and the harm caused to many. The Christian in society then doesn't seem like much of a promise. Not that, and again, not that those who aren't Christian also have a speed here. Again, can we not get out, right? It's not like, ooh, those non-Christians, they're winning this game. So in the short time I have this morning, I want to explore what Bart's Tombach lectures might have to offer to contemporary political theology uh, and perhaps even contemporary theological praxis, as well as some of the limitations of that offering. More specifically, placing the Tombach lecture in conversation uh, with no longer new, but nevertheless ongoing conversations in queer theory and theology about sociality and temporality, about how we do life together and what it is that we seek, and all of the presumptions wrapped up in those things. I want to consider the value, both theologically and politically, of a theopolitics of refusal, of what an ongoing refusal to fully embrace or claim any particular political or religious ends or means a posture of critique and negation that stems from our own eschatologically situated existence and epistemic limit, 
might mean for how we understand and do and interpret political engagement broadly. So a, a little bit about the Tombaugh lecture context and some gist. So the occasion, and, and you'll, you'll get more of this later this afternoon from Professor Dorian, the occasion in which Bart gives the lecture, the Christian Society, right, was the first religious socialist conference in Germany in the town of Tombaugh in September of 1919. To understand what Bart said when he, meant when he said he wanted out of society, I think it's helpful to give the lecture context, right? The First World War ended, in, and most of you know this, I'll, I'll go through it pretty fast. Ended in 1918 in November, right? Germany was defeated and devastated humiliated by the Treaty of Versailles, losing territory, forced to pay reparations, military scaled back significantly. The Weimar Republic was off to a pretty shaky start in the very beginning, right? The economy not, not doing so great, massive hyperinflation. At the same time, right, thinking of the context of the religious socialists, right? In October of 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution occurred, bringing communist government to power in Russia. The Second International, the Organization of Socialist and Labor Parties had dissolved. And debates, there were many debates happening, again, we'll hear more about this later today, amongst uh, religious socialists in uh, Switzerland about the third, right? Um, in, in November of 1918, there was a revolution in Germany based in socialist efforts, but most of the German socialist leaders had sided with the war effort since 1914, opposing the Bolsheviks and siding with German nationalists in the military establishment, leading to an avert, averting of communist takeover and paving the way for the formation of the Weimar Republic, right? So, and Swiss socialism was particularly unique in that it affirmed the state and its democratic institutions, but war had radicalized them, giving the parliament had removed a ton of protections for workers during, in the interest of increasing wartime productivity, right? 12 hour workdays were common, child labor was widespread, a strike at one point was in the works, but it was called off. So, hosted by two pastors from Hessen, the conference was attended by a little over 100 people. A wide variety of Christians in, from Germany who were deeply concerned at the revolution which had taken place in recent years. And now as Christians, we're on the lookout for new ways of politi in political and church life. Um, those who came to this conference were those who, quote, um, this is from Everhart Bush, saw no personal place for themselves in existing church trends and who felt that these trends held out little promise of solving the task which faced the church after the collapse of 1918. Bart is the, the red pastor had been unsurprisingly invited. Only eight years prior, uh, in a lecture to a trade union, Bart exclaimed, the real contents of the person of Jesus can in fact be summed up by these words, movement for social justice. Moreover, I believe that the social justice movement of the 19th and 20th centuries is not only the greatest and most urgent word of God to the present, but also in particular, a quite, a quite dis direct continuation of the spiritual power, which I've said, entered into history with Jesus. Bart's words here um, caused, some, caused some trouble, particularly with the, uh, causing the attention and, and chagrin of the owner of the local factory, who also happened to be the primary source of financial support of Bart's congregation, right? So all kinds of like, like and Bart still did it, right? He's like, nah, right? So uh, I want to dwell here just for a, a second and think about some connection between the context that you might've already kind of picked up on yourself between the context of the Tombaugh lectures and our context here over a hundred years later, right? In the year of our Lord, 2023. Thinking about connections between the political scenes, right? Pro uh, progressive politics um, like religious socialism of the time are indeed a kind of source of hope for some amidst political turmoil. But uh, as many of us have maybe experienced, uh, again, I know I have, also a source of deep frustration. And with that debate, um, one might think here to give some more examples and additional things like gun control and climate change, right, of progressive efforts in the United States around student loan debt or the healthcare system or the criminal justice system. On the one hand, there's effort to make changes, but there aren't enough. And it, sometimes it feels like the politicians aren't even trying. Even 10K and student loan debt forgiveness seems like a drop in the bucket. Uh, and that can't even get passed. And when it does, then it gets you know, held up in court. Uh, Obamacare couldn't even get a Medicare for all option included. And the cost of joining the marketplace is wildly high. Despite the building strength of the prison abolition movement, new prisons pop up literally every day. Um, also, uh, not to mention, thinking about the context, right, the Spanish flu of 1918 that had been raging across Germany and Europe. Um, so there's perhaps some similarities too in the catastrophe of COVID. Uh, there, there were the glimmers of the crisis of liberal government, where within a decade, of course, we now had weakened and disorganized. A uh, liberal party could not prevent the rise of a fascist right. Something that maybe doesn't seem too far off for some of us. And some of us maybe want to move to Canada. Not that it will go not be a thing there, but 
you know. So, uh, you know, when I think about the context of the Tombach lectures, I, uh, one, one image that comes into my mind is something like a gathering of Christian anti-capitalists, right? Following the August 12th, deadly Unite the Right rallies in Charlottesville and the January 6th insurrection, I consider what it might look like to the faithful in the midst of rising movements of Christian nationalism, white supremacy and fascism. Considering together what it means to act, to be faithful in the world, a world that is increasingly terrifying, but where one maybe finds some glimmers of hope in the communities of those resisting that terror. Again, remember, those who came to this conference were those who saw no personal place for themselves in the existing church trends and who felt that these trends held out little promise of solving the task with face the church. But for ex expecting some kind of encouragement and hope from the Red Pastor, right? Um, and at the beginning, it seemed like Bart was going to give them that. Acknowledging how we want out, right? There, there's like an affective and existential, like, yes, right? We're sighing together, like, uh. And how despite all our efforts, things remain as they were before. And here, Bart seems like he's going to lean into that hope, offer something. That it is here, the thought of the Christian in society becomes a promise. Bringing a new element in the midst of the old, a new truth in the midst of errors and lies. And instead, Okay, and I'm going to summarize to what I take to be the kind of heart of what Bart's doing in this lecture, the brief TLDR. Too long, don't read. Bart's like, nah, right? This ain't it, right? You want hope, potentially even direction about what we, we Christian socialists can do to bring about change, to help bring about the kingdom of God? I can't, not going to give you that. And I don't think it's helpful for me to give you that. Bart, in this Tombach lecture to these religious socialists, denies our ability, and with that, our attempts to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. For Bart, there's not a solution that we can accomplish, not an ethic about what it means to be Christian in society. We're not able to secure a better future. And instead, we, whoever we are, need to be patient and wait for God to act. Moreover, part and parcel with this, he refuses to embrace a notion of this we, refusing an appropriation of the Christian into a unified we. Um, as uh, in, in our workshop that, that, some, that we did, when this was postponed and all the things, uh, Hannah Reichel, I, I think, uh, summed it up really well, right? Um, when we were talking about this, where it's playing the role of the killjoy here, right? An, an invocation there for some of you might know to Sarah Ahmed and the idea of the feminist killjoy. Uh, at one point, Ahmed says, the word feminist killjoy came to me because she was already out there, a recognizable figure, a stereotype of feminist. Those miserable feminists who make misery their mission. Misery is not our mission, Ahmed says. But still, if misery is what we cause in saying what we say, doing what we do, we're willing to cop it, right? Bart's stepping into this kind of role of like, hold on, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of put a, put a stop on this, this thread. When looking at what grounds Bart refusal here, why Bart's the killjoy, two kind of interrelated themes stand out, and this is gonna be where I kind of go from here. Um, I've already kind of mentioned them, but, but to emphasize it. One, the rejection of our ability to secure the future. Seeing that as an idolatry, placing hope in ourselves rather than God, and one that hasn't exactly worked. Two, even more foundationally and interconnected, a rejection of the we. We problematically claim a we that thinks we can solve things. Within the structure that Bart has initially set up, society represents need, right, and the Christian hope, but quickly tears that down and points out that the Christian we are not that. We agree that the Christian, Bart explains, cannot mean the Christian. Neither the mass of the baptized, nor somehow the elect little company of religious socialists, nor even the most noble and pious Christians of whom we might otherwise think. The Christian is the Christ. The Christian is not us, but rather Christ in us. The Christ in us, he continues, does not refer to a psychic condition of being grasped or overpowered, but a presupposition. Christ is above us and behind us and beyond us. Moreover, our task, because there is not a we that can be appropriated as the Christian, is not that of fixing or saving the world. Though God's work in the world is by no means entirely distinct from us, we do indeed participate in it, God enters our society not through us, but rather vertically from above. As Bart puts it quite straightforwardly, only God can save the world. Bart's refusal here is not surprising, but consistent with and following the trajectory, what he does in the Romans commentary, first and second edition. And there's been a lot of thoughts about like uh, a reflection, scholarly reflection about this being the turn from, you know, Romans 1 to Romans 2, second edition. I'm, I'm more interested in the kind of sociopolitical dimension of what this means. 
for us and how we should live in the world as people, as citizens, as people of faith, as humans. Through the lens of the political and the ethical, one could certainly argue that Bart's posture of refusal, this allergy to any claiming of religious identity, and from there, this apparent apathy towards seeking change, is neither the most pastorally or politically efficacious or ethical from there, right? I want to challenge this argument a bit today um, by considering how Bart's theopolitical refusal might be instructive for us. And I want to do that by turning to a perhaps unlikely, um, but I think quite relevant interlocutor, that of queer negativity. Um, while I started with a quote from the Christian in Society, where they started to talk with that, I want to offer another quote in, in a kind of juxtaposition. But instead of giving the quote and stepping back, I'll offer a little bit of context first. So the year is 1996. The former, the former uh, Roman Catholic Cardinal of Boston, Bernard Law, denounced legislation giving health care benefits to same-sex partners of city employees. Doing so, he argued, would diminish the marital bond, a bond that was necessary for the upbringing of children, which was itself necessary for the flourishing of society. In 2003, soon after Law resigned for his failure to protect children from pedophilic priests, Pope John Paul II condemned same-sex marriage as parodies of authentic families, caricatures that have no future and cannot give future to any society. Reflecting on these statements, in one of the most off-sided passages from his provocative book, No Future, Queer Theory and the Death Drive, queer theorist and literary critic Lee Edelman writes, queers must respond to the violent force of such constant provocation, not only by existing, uh, insisting on our equal rights to the social order's prerogatives, not only by avowing our capacity to promote the order's coherence and integrity, but also by saying explicitly what law and the Pope and the whole of the symbolic order for which they stand here anyways, in each and every expression and manifestation of queer sexuality. Fuck the social order and the child in whose name we're collectively terrorized. Fuck Annie. Fuck the waif from Les Mis. Fuck the poor innocent kid on the net. Fuck laws with both capital L and with small. Fuck the whole network of symbolic relations and the future that serves as their prop. Edelman's queer politics of refusal here is one of the most poignant and debated in queer theory, um, but it's part of a whole lineage of queer negativity that goes back to 1987, um, before queer theory technically even existed as a term, Teresa de Loretta pointed in 1989, um, to Leo Bersani's provocative essay, Is the Rectum a Grave? Um, written and published during the height of the AIDS crisis, um, Bersani critiqued the gay community's desire for acceptance and assimilation. And he said, basically, I'll, I'll kind of move faster through this. Like, that's not what we should be going through. Um, follow, so following Bersani, Edelman widens the force of this negativity and uh, argues against what he calls reproductive futurism. Working with a, a Lacanian framework, a psychoanalytic framework, Edelman analyzes and critiques the way in which the social order through the figure of the child. He's not thinking about like actual children. He's not like, boo, children, right? But the way, the way this idea of the child, mm -hmm. right, functions, the child with the capital C, this image, this figure of the child imagines and invokes the problem, the promise of a better future, where the loss and alienation of the present will be overcome. Look, we have to fix the climate for our children. Look, we have to not have, you know, any books about critical race theory in schools for our children. We must conform and sacrifice, not for our own sakes, but for the sake of the future, for our children. Within the logic um, of reproductive futurism that frames our social order, the danger to that future then is materialized, is present in the figure of the queer whose failure to invest the child with the privilege of value, right, queers aren't having kids, at least not in the, like, again, a figure, figural. Failure to invest the child with the privilege of value pits them not only against the child, but also against the future's assurance of social viability. Queerness thus names the side of those not fighting for the children and figures as the place of the social order's death drive. The future has no place for the truly queer, and so our political and social task is to stop trying to conform to it as to do so is to erase queerness and embrace the present and our status as the other in it. Um, you might notice some very distinctive differences between uh, Bart and Edelman here. Most notable, maybe the latter's frequent use of the F-bomb, um, or perhaps the fact that focuses on the queer rather than the Christian, or perhaps most notable rather than, I guess, noticeable, is the different frameworks they're operating with. One theological, the other psychoanalytic. Nevertheless, and this is what I want to highlight here, there are some striking similarities that I, I want to suggest might be instructive not so much in spite of, but even because of their differences. One of the key sites where these similarities amongst differences are instructive, I think, is that of the why. 
Why this refusal? What motivates and fuels it? Um, I can't I can't speak to the underlying affect, of course, but for both Bart and Edelman, the refusal is marked by some undergirding presuppositions about the human condition, a kind of negative theological anthropology, an underlying reason as to why humans are unable to secure the future. Uh, for Edelman, that undergirding structure is Lacan's psychoanalytic theory um, of subject formation with an attention to intrapsychic processes um, that happen within and through the sphere of the brain. Getting into Lacan, will, um, here's a basic, like, 001, not like 101, but like 001, right? So according to Lacan, theory of subject formation, white re-sacrificed jouissance or unmediated pleasure for the signifier, this capacity to desire. A process that crystallizes around the fantasy of having lost what Lacan, following Freud, calls the thing. An original non-object or object that offered unmitigated juice. We are thus from the get-go subjects of life. Consequently, we spend our lives trying to find substitutes for what we imagine we've lost. We stuff one object of desire after another into the void left by the signifier in hopes that one day we can heal our wounds and undo that alienation. Yet, according to Lacan, no object is ultimately able to satisfy us because the lack is within our very being is constitutive of our very subjectivity and as such utterly irredeemable. The world cannot give us all that we need and in developing as humans in a messy world as part of a symbolic order, we're necessarily gonna be unsatisfied and yet must conform in order to function in the world. A process that is both necessarily coercive as it constructs us shaping us by norms that generate desires and fantasies in service of their own naturalization, we only get glimpses of that original satisfaction, that jouissance which serves as the no to this order. The counter to it, um, yet we think we can obtain it, can grasp it, and pursue that fantasy through those other fantasies that construct and constrain. So the ethical move for Lacan then, at least according to Mari Ruti, may she rest in peace, the Lacanian theorist that died too young recently, like last week, um, is a kind of both and. Right? One needs to function in the symbolic order, but given the hegemonic and coercive nature of it, uh, the ethical act is a self-destructive and destructive act through which the subject utters a categorical no to the symbolic order, plunging the subject for at least a moment into the jouissance of the real. But that can't be sustained. The process is a dialect. Edelman takes up this framework to a political level. He says, oh, here we are. Like the network of signifying relations that forms the Lacanian symbolic, Politics might function as the framework within which we experience social reality, but only insofar as it compels us to experience that reality in form of a fantasy. For Edelman following Lacan, the order holds within it a structural antagonism, right? As Kent Brittnall succinctly summarizes, the social constitutes itself in part by figuring as threats to its existence. Um, a, a multitude of disruptive, dangerous figures, national, religious, racial, sexual, economic. Queerness, both as the figure of the queer as the otherness to the figure of the child, in the reign of reproductive futurism, and is that which broadly figures otherness is the social order's death drive. Queerness marks a rejection, a resistance, a refusal of the fantasy to that order. So for Edelman, the refusal is structural, we, uh, the structure of that being the social order is understood. So for Bart, then, one could call this refusal structural as well, but that structure is mediated by something else, that of sin, which one might argue is not distinct from the social order, and if I had more time, I'm already, I'm like way behind. Um, uh, I'd stop to think about the connections help us might think uh, about sin in a more social and systemic way than an individual way. Um, but why, why the Tombach lecture marks for many a kind of turning point for Bart's theology, but the red pastor had been growing weary at the state of things, at the use of religion, of God for political purposes for a while, right? We know the 1914 manifesto that Bart was pretty devastated by having signed by three, not all of his professors, right? Um, uh, in 1915, at his brother's wedding, um, he overheard the influential pastor turned liberal politician Friedrich Naumann say, now we can see how well religion can be used for the purposes of war. Bart's reply was, what are you saying? Use religion? May one, can one do that? Proceeded to get in a huge argument with Naumann. Naumann says, all religion is right for us, whether it is called the Salvation Army or Islam, providing that it helps us to hold out through the war. And Bart was like, ah, that's my, again, TLDR. Um, uh, and saw so this is a, again, a sign of bankruptcy of German theology, right? Moreover, the disappointing reaction um, of the international socialist movement to the war made it clear to Bart that socialism too was fully of this world and couldn't bring the kingdom of God by itself. However, it could be 
one of the most important reflections of God's kingdom. The socialists, Bart wrote, were filled with enthusiasm for the war and therefore no better than the others. Uh, Bart, Bart especially got, got bothered by the religious socialists. So for Bart, this reality that we want out but can't seem to get out, um, that things remain despite our attempts for revolution, doesn't mean we need to figure out how to do it better, because we can't, but is the result of a fundamental misappropriation, that there is a we that we can identify that can do it better. Leonard Ragaz wrote in a text in 1915, um, oh, uh, that irritated Bart, um, arguing that in light of the world war, it could no longer be a matter of reconciling the kingdoms of God and the world, but only to represent the kingdom of God in contrast to the kingdom of the world. Uh, in a letter to Thurnison reflecting on this, Bart wrote, is it self-evident that we represent the kingdom of God? Have we then grasped, experienced the kingdom of God at all in its radical seriousness? Not a word about the knowledge of God, of conversion, of waiting for the kingdom of God, all of which, in fact, is a priori of all representing. Where Bart's refusal has a different foundation, it shares with Edelman a recognition of the constraints and limits of human existence, um, an inability for the human, uh, human to get it right, and a rejection of the fantasy that we can. And as such, it challenges our orientations, our hope about the future. As Bart explains, it says, even the behavior of the most distinguished Christian in society leaves us in doubt as to whether their actions follow the will of God. Why? When we contemplate this simple command, why do we turn our gaze almost out of necessity, Bart asks, to the future? Is tomorrow supposed to be better? Why is it that only the Philistines can actually be satisfied with life in themselves? Like Edelman, Bart challenges our ability to secure the future, recognizing the inevitable tragedy for the tragic constraints of our fallen world. And both, interestingly, name our efforts to secure the future as idolatrous. I love how Gadamer, um, when he discusses Bart's critique of liberal theology in Truth and Method, Bart's critique, he writes, was not directed so much at critical history, per se, but at the theological self-satisfaction that considered its results in understanding of the, human, of the Holy Scriptures. Just as Bart challenges our abilities and thus our efforts to know and secure a better future, so too does Edelman propose queerness as the non-teleological negativity that refuses the leavening of piety. Here's one arena where I actually think Bart offers something to Edelman, which in a queer theory world, a queer theology world, I think I might get egged for that a little bit, but I'm gonna, uh, I'm in a, I'm in a safe space here. Edelman locates queerness, right? A kind of we or us, however actual is figural uh, or figural as that which marks the social order's death drive that serves as the, the site of refusal, right? But one great critique of Edelman in, in this, these queer theoretical conversations is that of a turn to the we, right? Uh, and the risks of undermining difference and thus furthering otherness, right? Again, if the structure of otherness is always present, but even claiming a we that is the like anti-normative or the other, ooh, that was a bark oh. Oh, we're not there yet. Ha. Oh, now it's gone again. Okay. Um, um, right. As Lynn Huffer puts it, uh, queer theories claim a radical inclusivity via a kind of antisociality. What Bersani calls bringing out or celebrating the homo in all of us makes sameness a precondition of recognition, thereby revealing radical queer inclusivity as a falsely universalizing claim. Put another way, behind queer theory's seemingly infinite possibilities of unconstrained local performances, lurks the age-old trap of universalism, its assumption of difference into the seam sameless, sameness of a seamless we. Bart, however, won't even give us that. The Christian cannot claim itself as a we or as an identity. Christ in us, understood in its whole Pauline breadth, Bart notes, is a warning. I have a better quote here. Um, not that you guys can say. Um, uh, is a warning that we shall do well not to build again the fence which separates the chosen from the rest. Jew from Gentile, so-called Christian from non-Christian. The community of Christ is a building open on every side, for Christ is always also for the others, for those who are outside, for those who have died. Right. Uh, and this refusal for Bert extends to identity as well. I'm reminded of one of the quotes from CD2, I think, maybe three. I didn't run the, the citation here in my note. Uh, he says at one point, as participators in this possibility, we are a riddle to ourselves. Um, so making this connection between queer negativity and Bart's the political refusal um, that still doesn't do anything for us with how we should live, right? With, with the grounds and the politics and the ethics of it all, right? Like Bart Edelman also has been accused of being apolitical or anti-liberatory, right? In his stance of refusal, um, he's been accused of ignoring or even causing harm to suffering communities and doing so. And I, I hear these critiques and, and I want to take them seriously, but I wonder if there's another way of looking at it. 
right? After all, both Bart and Edelman and Bersani, which is part of the reason I mentioned him at the beginning, are not speaking as safe outsiders to marginalized communities. Again, Bart's trickier, I think. But um, yes, both undeniably have degrees of privilege, but both are also part of the communities that they are speaking to. Edelman's a queer man and why he calls for a, a, a stand of always resisting the future and challenging the orders of conserve, that conserve it. He nevertheless participates in it, right? He's, he's married to a dude, right? Um, it's an interesting, right? He's like, no future. But like, I'm going to still like live my life. Similarly, Bart himself, while critical of and not much of offering much positive direction to the religious socialists he's speaking to, is in fact one himself. He joined the Swiss Christian movement for religious socialism in 1911. And yet with this in mind, they both take a stance of refusal. But that refusal, rooted structurally, serves as a kind of stance of hypervigilance, but does not mean an action or stasis, or I guess doesn't need to. For both Bart and Edelman, the task then is one of movement. Are we back? Um, uh, in comments to a panel at the Modern uh, Language Association, um, Lee Edelman talks about his uh, understanding of queer negativity by comparing it to the work of sculptors. He says, the spurious apostles of negativity hammer new idols out of their good, while the aim of queer negativity is rather to hammer them into dust. Though Edelman gets so kind of meta in his hypervigilance that he also cautions. He says, we must not make the swing of the hammer in and in itself. Yet also, interestingly, he recognizes that in not pursuing a clear good, in our vigilance to attend to idolatry and harm, that, quote, such queerness proposes in the place of the good something outward of him. Um, something he wants, I want to, he said I, see, he wants to call better, though it promises, he quickly clarifies, absolutely nothing. Drawing heavily on Edelman's work, Kent Brittenall argues that movement is precisely the task of queer theology, that queer theology should produce movement, should strive to unsettle. And that perhaps there is something to be gained by recognizing the impossibility of what we strive to accomplish. For Bart, our task is nothing more than to initiate a priestly movement of this need and hope, right? Uh, and I won't get, uh, God is the one who moves, but we have a God-given, uh, a mighty God-given restlessness. And our task is to understand and enter it. The bulk of Bart's work in the Tombaugh lecture is outlining this movement, the three points of departure, right? One, to understand means yes to creation, the thesis, the rest, the patience. Two, the antithesis, the unrest, the struggle. And finally, three, to understand means to be forgiven. Some translations translate this as given. I don't speak German. Another thing to probably not say at a Bart conference. Um, so I don't know. Um, uh, in order to forgive or to give. Um, so it's, this is the reality of God's reign as beyond our accounts. For both Edelman and Bart, this is more of a way of approaching the world than a particular politics. But isn't that precisely the point? Instead of particular action, given the reality of our own limits, the task is to recognize that we are going to get it wrong and to be vigilant and continue to critically examine the ways we might get it wrong, all while continuing to move. Um, one might think of some examples here and, and some, some history, right? White feminism, realizing it was doing it wrong by excluding Black women's experience, focusing, focusing primarily on women's right to work, amongst other things, right? Gay men and lesbians, realizing they were doing it wrong when excluding trans folks from employment non-discrimination, Feminists realizing, forget feminists are an easy, easy target here. And I say this, I am one, I can say this, right? Feminists doing it wrong and excluding trans women and actively advocating against their rights and humanity, right? Um, as, as someone prone to anxiety, um, uh, I'm, I'm pretty prone to the freeze response, right? Um, I think fear, right? And particularly fear of doing it wrong uh, tends to paralyze me, right? Um, being stuck in the freeze response is a rather common experience, not for only those who are anxious among us, but for those who have endured trauma. And there's certainly, you know, a Venn diagram of overlap there, right? Wh whose fight or flight responses have been thrown off kilter, right? This is a common reality for those who are part of marginalized communities, right? Not to mention that being stuck in pretty awful situations, often in the name of for the greater good or even for one's own good, uh, is a reality many experience. So perhaps then I wonder if movement and our inability to get it right is a, is a source of hope and action, not hopeless, right? But rather freeing, right? If we are not going to get it right, um, the recognition that we can act and move anyways is, um, is, is a, a, an act of freedom. Um, the dialectical path of movement and constant negation for Bart is what uh, Christian Tietz explains, understood as a path along a ridge. Along the narrow ridge, we can walk and keep walking. Oh, do I have this mark here? Um, uh, for if we still stand, we will fall. It might be to the right or to the left, but it will definitely be down. Thus, the only thing left is an appalling spectacle for all those overcome by dizziness, where we keep looking from one side to the other, from the position to its negation and negation to the position. The only thing we can do is clarify the yes and the no and the no and the yes, pausing no longer than a moment in the gaze of the yes or no. 
right? Like again, on a tight walk, if you know, if you're doing, what do they call that one where it's like loose and you have to move? Um, yeah. Back lining, thank you. Um, right, like you have to keep moving and if you slow down, you're gonna fall off. Um, of course, later Bart took a little bit of a different approach by which I mean, he acknowledged the ways in which his refusal was indeed kind of tied to earlier on a kind of inaction. Um, in a letter uh, to his friend, he wrote, I've often accused my, uh, been often accused that I was silent in Germany to avoid any confusion between the kingdom of God and any kind of political ideology. Perhaps this puritism was necessary or at least excusable at the time, uh, right? Today, that is no longer the case. Today, the totalitarian state is not on the scene as an idea, but as an effective power. And I cannot understand how one could say anything but no, out loud or quietly, to this thing. But one, uh, but we who can still speak must do so. And in particular, when I myself have a voice that is widely listened to, then I don't see how I can be a silent in a moment where everything is at stake. There's action here, but that action is still rooted in a no. I wonder if we might invert Bart's famous and perhaps for somewhat baffling statement, my, it's baffling to me, statement in 1933, right? To do theology just as before, as if nothing had and consider what it might mean to do theology, not as nothing was happening, but doing theology just as before, as if things keep freaking happening, right? As if there's nothing new under the sun. To think resistance then as a kind of positive, both literally and epistemically, refusing to accept things the way that they are, a hyper awareness about what might be excluded or otherwise about what might risk harm. So to conclude as a kind of sum up, what does Bart potentially offer Edelman here? And what, what does Edelman give to how we read Bart? Bart, as I've already mentioned, I think further clarifies and insists on this refusal or appropriating or claiming any we, right? By hold, holding this hypervigilance, by refusing this appropriation into a kind of identity category or collective unity, Bart resists a conflation into sameness and with that a kind of stasis, right? How terrible would it be if amongst all the institutions, it is the church which does not see this, but rather puts all of its efforts into maintaining that secure equilibrium of existence that humans are supposed to lose. Right. But, but what does Edelman give to Bart here? I think there's a kind of emphasis on negative activity, right? Edelman, while firmly rooted in the negative, has, has a kind of more active negativity. We are going to always get it wrong, but nevertheless, we do have a hammer. Uh, in talking about this with friend and colleague Shelly Tilton yesterday, um, she offered an image that I think is really helpful, that of imagining Bart and Edelman on a threshold, waiting at a door. Right? Bart's there, waiting for Jesus to open the door. But for Edelman, the door is blocked. We must destroy what is in front of the door. There's a sense of urgency, not of grasping, of movement, but of movement, right? A negative movement, that of destruction. To put these images together, it is not helping God arrive, that's on God, but our way of waiting in a way that is faithful and making sure God's path is not in. Thank you, Brandy and Devin, we invite the response. Thank you, Dr. Daniels, for your reflections. Um, I'm, I'll be very brief, just a, a few sort of thoughts, um, comments and questions sort of, um, off the cuff provoked by your um, wonderful reflections here. Um, I, I very much like this um, mapping of Bart and Edelman. I think there's um, much to be drawn out there. And it made me think of some of the kinds of tensions uh, within queer theory of the sort of trajectory of Edelman and this, this direction toward um, no futures versus something like queer utopias and thinking about Munoz, Jose Esteban Munoz and cruising utopia and the ways that Munoz follows someone like Ernst Bloch. Uh, and then we can think of the theological genealogies there to somebody like Moltmann and this whole other sort of um, eschatologically oriented um, orientation and theology. And so, you know, this, this sort of no future versus queer utopia um, although even for somebody like Bloch, I mean, for him, hope and desire still stem from a lack. So there's, there's still a sort of similarity and subjectivity there. But I would just love to, you know, if you, uh, you know, in your response, want to reflect a little bit on helping us kind of map these territories here to think of the Bart Edelman sort of trajectory versus like the Mignol's Moltmann or whatever other sort of theological options are out there. It might just be kind of helpful to think about in terms of uh, theological conversations with, with queer theory. And the question remains, right, where, does, where is solidarity in Bart? What are, the, what are the possibilities? What's the basis for solidarity? If there is no we, um, is solidarity possible? Um, and I think, you know, I feel this critique of that Barton Edelman that you've, that you've recounted here very much in line with the questions that came up last night in terms of our concerns about the limitations of the political. Um, and whether the political is um, a sufficient concept for, for us to engage with. My sense is that 
you know, for, for Edelman, there's a critique of the social order as it has been constructed, but there is still a sense of a potential otherwise. And I wonder though, for Bart, if it's just the critique of the political as such, and is there any otherwise, right? Like I think for Edelman it's very much the sort of structures of Western political society that we've received. I wonder, I mean, uh, this is a, this is a question, right? Um, where there still is a sense that there, that there could still be an otherwise. And I don't, I don't, I don't know if that's the case for Bart, right? So are there limitations there? Is there any space for hope? Is there any space for productive desire or sort of politicized desire, um, that, that remains or, or is it just negativity, right? Is it just the nine? Is it just the refusal, uh, that, that Bart offers? And I, I think, you know, you've intimated that there are resources there, but I'd love to hear you, um, perhaps reflect on a few of those and I'll stop there. Thank you. I don't know how to respond to the Edelman versus Munoz thing without like spending like 20 minutes getting into it. But I think that's interesting. We, some of us were talking about this a bit last night. And uh, I, I think there's more uh, against some many queer theorists on this. Uh, some of the, um, I think there's more overlap between Edelman and Munoz than, than some would argue. Um, but I think, um, again, for, for, so for Jose Esteban Munoz, right, this idea of cruising utopia, right? He wants to say, he wants to focus on the future, but say we can never get there, right? the then and there of queer futurity, right? And, and looks at the future as this horizon, right? This something we move towards, but can never get to, right? And I think Edelman is just, I, I, I find some, and I find that very compelling, right? But I find something in this, like, hypervigilance, even in relation to that, like, who, who is the we that's getting there, right? And when we think we're getting there, and I, I think that's one way, actually, in which Edelman critiques the we in a way more than Munoz does. I think Munoz claimed claim that we have queerness, right? Uh, and again, that solidarity piece. Um, Okay. Where is solidarity? Is solidarity possible if there's no we? I, I think my initial response to that, like, uh, perhaps there's solidarity in having been wrongly we, right? Uh, be, being, being categorized as a, as a we, right? That there's solidarity in that and a broader solidarity in terms of non-identity action, right? What does it mean to get to fight against the people who have been wrongly or wrongly classified, wrongly otherized? Like, solidarity, not, a negative solidarity, right? Not in identity but it or or in a, in a constant desire to kind of fluff off the ways in which identity um i i think with the i think it's really interesting i i think i would and this i think would be a more like niche conversation i actually i think there's more of a otherwise for bart than there's for edelman um because of edelman's framework like the psychoanalytic stuff what i tried to give a little bit to like there's always the other there's always the other Right. Whereas Bart, there's the like the radical break God that's going to disrupt that. We just can't. We don't have for, for Edelman. It's like this is it all the way. Right. Like um, Kim Brennan, actually, it's interesting. Uh, and I, I thought there was interesting over his last year, but in very weird ways, calls Edelman's uh, politics, politics of revelation. <laughs> right. Um, but not revelation as like the revelation of God, but like a revelation of this is the way the world is. Right. Like that, that, that we are always going to other. Right. That we are always that there, there's a. Uh, there's interesting overlaps, I think, here with with Edelman and Schmidt and Lafour right? uh, against like this idea of a structural antagonism, right? Uh, the, the friend enemy distinction. I think that's happening in England in some really interesting ways. Is there a space for hope? Yeah, totally, right? Like I, I don't. I guess I don't know why hope has to be positive. Like I, I think negativity is a hope. One of the things I wrote up last night. Uh, one of the things that I worked on recently. Um, is an argument for Edelman as a resource for um, survivors of sexual violence, right? Um, and particularly, I, I get into more the political here, but Edelman, the the, the Lacan stuff is structured all into uh, like who, um, like who the self is, right? And the, the, again, the subjects of lack, right? Um, and oftentimes, a, a common uh, invocation, particularly in religious circles, but not only, certainly in psycho, uh, psychological and therapeutic settings, right? This idea of like, you know, after, you know, if you survive sexual violence, you can be made holy. Uh, and, and Edelman's kind of like, nah, right? And, and arguing that there's actually something liberate um, and hopeful about saying, you're not going to be put back together in the same way, but there's something else that can right? Like that by embracing the no, right? You're not constantly getting it wrong and feeling like a failure because you couldn't put it back together again. And like, you're not a good survivor, right? Um, but actually, there's there's a freedom there, and like you can do other things, right? And you can think of new ways of being in the world, right? 
because there's no way of getting it right, right? So I think there's a create, there's a hope in creativity, right? Of like, we're always going to get it wrong, but like, cool, let's try new things, right? 